وأنفقوا مما رزقناهم وأنفقوا مما رزقناهم سرا وعلانية سرا وعلانية يرجون تجارة لن تبور ليوفيهم أجورهم ويزيدهم من فضله إنه غفور شكور والذي أوحينا إليك من كتابه هو الحق مصدقا لما بين بين يديه إن الله بعباده لخبير بصير ثم أورثنا الكتاب الذي نصدفينا من عبادنا فمنهم ظالم لنفسه ومنهم مقتصد ومنهم مقتصد ومنهم سابق بالخيرات بإذن الله ذلك هو الفضل الكبير جنات عدن يدخلون يحلون فيها من أساور يحلون فيك من أساور من ذهب ولؤلؤا ولباسهم فيها حرير وقالوا الحمد لله الذي أذهب عنا الحزن إن ربنا لغفور شكور الذي أحلنا دار المقامة من فضله لا يمسنا لا يمسنا فيها نصب ولا يمسنا فيها لغوب بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم أعنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك اللهم آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار Whenever we want to talk about توبة we get a reaction where some people think it's a great topic, but it's not for me, it's for somebody else. That's when you see Tawbah on a list of topics in a lecture series or online, what do you think to yourself? You think it's a great topic, right? And we need it. But not me, it's somebody else who needs it. And we're divided somehow into two types of groups. Some who say, Tawbah is not for me, it's for somebody else because I envision Tawbah to be for those who are committing major sins. That's the alcohol drinkers, the gamblers, those who are committing zina, those who are taking drugs, selling drugs. When I see them, I realize they really need to know about Tawbah. So if there's a lecture about Tawbah, all of them need to attend it. But I, who are not a participant in these apparent major sins, I don't need to hear about that. So I can skip it, right? Or the other one is those who are participant in all of these major sins who have decided that Tawbah is for the pure. Tawbah is for those who want to be close to Allah, but look at me and my lifestyle and the terrible things that I've done or I'm doing, I'm far away from Tawbah. So Tawbah is not for me. So somehow we manage to believe, whether I'm on this side or that side, that Tawbah is for the other, but it's not mine. I'm not invited to become a Tawab, a repentant. Whereas Allah Azza wa Jal makes it an obligation on all of us to be repentant. Tubu ilallahi jami'a. Mean repent to Allah Azza wa Jal, all of you. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
said, Ya ayyuhan nasu tubu ila bari'ikum aw ila rabbikum. He says, O people, repent to Allah. فَإِنِّي أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ فِي الْيَوْمِ سَبْعِينَ مَرَّةٍ أو أكثر من سبعين مرة وفي رواية مئة مرة He says, O people, repent to your Rabb for indeed I ask Allah for forgiveness I, and repent to Him each day more than 70 times and another narration a hundred times So the Prophet wasallam practices tawbah or not? Yes or no? Yes. yes. And he does it every day or not? Every day. And how many times every day? 70 to 100. So the Prophet ﷺ does tawbah that it's part of his, his word, portion of dhikr of Allah is to repent back to Allah a hundred times each day. That means as a Muslim, no matter what I'm doing or not doing, I need to have tawbah every day if the Prophet ﷺ is doing this. And we'll go, insha'Allah, into why he does that wasallam. But we want to also tackle the question of if I'm doing something wrong, that means that the doors of tawbah are closed and there is no hope for me. No, if you despair of Allah's mercy, ذَلِكَ ظَنُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Meaning, وَمَنْ يَقْنَطُ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ رَبِّهِ Who uh, despairs of Allah's mercy except those who are misguided. Those who don't know Allah Azza wa Jal. But no matter what you do, you can repent from it. Right? No matter what you do. It goes all back to our father Adam alayhi salam. And I'm not going to discuss the story in detail because you know the story very well. Adam was in heaven. Hawa was in heaven. Adam alayhi salam was there with our mother Hawa. Allah gives them a command. They disobey that command. And they lose the privilege of being in Jannah. And they are sent down to this earth. And Allah azza wa jal says فَتَلَقَّ آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ Adam now who is in a state of sorrow imagine yourself being in Jannah and eating from it and seeing what every, every splendid sight in Jannah the smell, the sight, the touch the peace of it and losing it all and being sent down to this earth what do you feel? What type of regret would you have? What kind of agony would you be going through? So it is reported that Adam alayhi salam was pleading with Allah azza wa jalla. He says, Ya Allah, did you not create me with your hand? He says, Yes, Ya Allah, did you not put me in heaven? He says, Yes, Ya Allah, did you not have the angels prostrate to me? He says, Yes. He says, If I reform and fix what I've done, would you bring me back? He said, Yes. And Allah says in the Quran, فَتَلَقَّ آدَمُ Adam received from Allah statements of repentance. And Adam accepted them and repeated them and repented to Allah through them. Allah says, فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ Allah accepted his repentance. So Adam made a mistake, right? قَالَ رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا They said both of them, Ya Allah, we've wronged ourselves. وَإِن لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ And if you do not forgive us and be merciful with us, we'll be among the losers. Meaning we're at your mercy, Ya Allah. We've done wrong. And we're asking for your forgiveness. If you don't forgive us, we're not going to have anything left. And Allah forgave them. So Adam made a mistake and Allah forgave him. And like your father and mother... You are prone to making mistakes. This is in your and my DNA. Rasulullah sallallahu wasallam says, "Kullu bani Adam khatta." All the children of Adam are doers of mistakes or sinners. Right? Can you avoid sin? 
No. Can you avoid making mistakes? No. So it means that all of humanity from A to Z are khatta. They make mistakes. And they're frequent makers of mistakes, frequent sinners. So what is the way out of this? How do we fix it? How do we become better? You follow the model of Adam alayhi salam where you repent to Allah. And the Prophet says, وَخَيْرُ الْخَطَّائِينَ التَّوَّابُونَ And the best of sinners are those who repent. So you have this pool of humanity. There were everybody sins, but there are some among humanity who rise above all of that. And it's through repentance. So you have the model of Adam. And you have the other model of Iblis. Iblis committed a sin. What was the problem with Iblis? The problem with Iblis is his defiance. Was he going to repent? No. In fact, he was rebellious. Allah Azza wa Jal chastises him, criticizes him for what he has done. And Iblis, instead of asking for mercy, asking for forgiveness, he says, no, delay me. His request is what? Delay me till the day of judgment so I can destroy Adam and his children. It's added evil. Rebellion and evil. So you have two models. The model of this is wrong and I'll keep doing it. Or this is wrong and I'll stop it. And the first is the model of Iblis that we talked about, the one that will be condemned to hellfire, and the other one is the model of Adam. If you look like your father, you're just. If you follow the footsteps of your father, then you are just. And that is what Allah wants from us, to follow the footsteps of Adam alayhi salam. The issue and the problem is not in making mistakes. The issue and the problem is in persisting in doing those mistakes and not repenting and going back to Allah Azza wa Jal. Of despairing of Allah's mercy or believing that it's okay to have these mistakes and that they are part of your life. They're a common type of existence. Everybody sins and so sin becomes normal. He says, no, that is wrong. That is wrong. Because... A condition for us to arrive at heaven is to be forgiven. And Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who yaqbalu tawbata an ibadih. Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who accepts repentance from this, his slaves. And he yabsutu yadahu bil-layl liyatuba musi'u al-nahar. Wa yabsutu yadahu bil-nahari liyatuba musi'u al-layl. Allah Azza wa Jal extends his hand in the morning so that the one who had committed sin at night would repent. And the one would, Allah would extend his hand at, uh, at night so that the one who had made mistakes in the morning would repent. Meaning Allah Azza wa continuously offers us the chance to repent and to come back to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the reason that Allah does that is He knows very well that we make mistakes and we need Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive. And Allah loves it when you repent and hates it when you turn away from Him. Now as a person who makes mistakes, the first question that I want to ask myself is why should I repent? What is the thing that is going to motivate, motivate me to repent right now? Because at tawbah wajibatun ala al fawr. The repentance is an obligation immediately, meaning if I make a sin, should I repent tomorrow or immediately right after? Immediately. What is the thing that is going to motivate me and prompt me to repent and not delay repentance? It is that when you commit a sin, you're putting yourself in danger. Now and after your death. Sin is poison. Sin is a black mark, black spot on your life, your heart, and your iman. So, suppose that you 
earn money from haram. And you think that you've won by the fact that you were able to gather this money. And it's a lot of money. The problem with haram money is that it will doom you if you consume it. If you bring it into your family, it will take baraka away from them. If you feed yourself haram, you will find the consequence of eating haram. There will be no baraka in your health, in the money that you collect, in the house that you buy, in the car that you purchase, in the lifestyle that you choose. There will be no baraka in it. In fact, your own mood, your own emotions will be in danger. Because when you bring the shaitan in, and the shaitan is always the companion of sin. If you commit a sin, you bring the shaitan closer to you and to your household and to your spouse and to your children, to your parents, inside your house. So when you commit a ma'asiyah, or you stay away from an obligation, meaning the time of the salah comes and you don't pray, and then the next time comes and you don't pray, and instead of that, you're looking at haram or listening to haram. And instead of that, you leave your house and you earn from haram. What you're doing is that you're becoming a companion of the shaitan. And when the shaitan is right next to you, don't ask about the amount of agony that he injects into your soul. You're not going to be happy with your life. You're going to be agitated completely. You're going to be depressed. You're going to be anxious. You'll always feel guilty. You'll always feel unsatisfied. You'll always feel that there is something missing from your life. No matter how much you try to fill it with the trivial and dis as many distractions as you can fill it with. I'll go out. I'll buy new things. I'll travel. I'll buy another new thing. But none of these things will make you happy because what you're doing is haram. And if you're spending on your family from haram, or you're living a haram type of life, meaning your children see you drinking alcohol, your children see you taking drugs, or you take drugs or sell drugs, and you think that I'm going to just collect and save some money, and from that I will start a business, let's say, or get married, or spend on my family. He says, if you're doing this, then you're not going to see barakah in your children. You are going to suffer as a consequence when you see your children straying and tormenting you. Not, not intentionally, but because there is no barakah in it. And you're the one who chased the barakah away and brought the shaitan in. So the children will torment you, and your spouse will torment you, and your possessions will torment you, and you will not know where to go. And in fact, your own heart will torture you. And you'll be living in fear. And you'll not know where this is coming from. Until you go back to examining the fact that you were sinning. And you were upsetting Allah Azza wa Jal. And you were not responding to his calls. And then you ask yourself, how can I come back? I've done so many terrible things. And because of that distance, how many years have you spent not praying? Not asking Allah Azza wa Jal, spending from haram, earning from haram, eating haram, listening to haram, guiding people to haram, immersed in the haram until the haram is your addiction. As so you say to yourself, how can I escape? And that is when desperation seeps into a person's heart. You say, it's too late for me. Yeah, it's for those people. It's for those people who go to the masjid. But for me, I can repent. And you forget that Allah Azza wa Jal says, Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. Allah forgives all sins. Ya ibadi alladheena asrafu ala anfusihim la taqnatu min rahmatillah. O you, O my slaves who have wronged themselves abundantly many times over, do not despair of Allah's mercy. Allah accepts all repentance as long as you're alive disbelief polytheism whatever it is allah accepts it as long as there is an intention do you want to change or not 
And you know the story very well of the one who killed 99? You know the story very well. So do you imagine killing 99 people in cold blood? Because you're a gangster, because you're a killer, a hitman, whatever it is, but 99 or a Subhanallah, 99 people, but yet there is something in that man that refused to surrender to the fact that this is it, that is my story. Because all of us have a story, right? So the question is, what is your story? So from a young, remember when you were very young and someone would ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? I, and you tell them, I want to be what? Give me examples. What did you want to be when you were young? What? Nothing? You want it to be something, right? A policeman, a fireman, or a teacher, a doctor, right? That's the beginning of your story, right? This is how I see myself, and that's what I'll do. And as you grow up, you start keep modifying that story. Well, I'm not going to be a fireman, but... I want to be something else. So you work towards that or you study and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And so you develop another story. You change the narrative a little bit. But you still have a story and it's how you see yourself. I see myself as a person who's hardworking or not, intelligent, uh, who's talented in this way or not, who's destined by the will of Allah, of course, to be here and to be there. What is your story? So that man... Refused to believe that his story is that, that he's a killer and nothing else. And that he should go to hellfire and nothing else. He refused to believe this. And he had that glimmer of hope in him that Allah can forgive and change, my, change me. That's the thing that you want to always have, hope. So that's why when he goes to this person, first person that he asked, a worshiper, a abid, and he asked him, these are my crimes. Can Allah forgive me? So that person said, no. Closed. The door is closed. So he kills him. Again, his temper took over. His habit took over. Now he has a hundred. But still he did not give up. Until he went to the more knowledgeable man and he asked, can I be accepted? Can I repent? And he says, yes, who stops you from repentance? Who stands between you and Allah? It's just that your environment, your surroundings, your friends are bad. You need to migrate. And so he starts his migration away from that village and city into another more righteous village and city. And he dies along the way. I knew the story. What happens after? The angels descend and they argue. The angels of Rahmah, they say, we want to take him. The angels of punishment, they say, we want to take him. And they argue, well, he came repenting to Allah. The others were saying, he committed so many crimes. And then Allah tells them what? Measure the distance between his death spot and that righteous village and that unrighteous wicked village that he migrated from. See to which he's closer and take him there. And so Allah Azza wa makes the distance between him and the righteous city shrink so that he would go to where? Jannah. If he did not despair of Allah's mercy, why do you have the shaitan convince you that you are far from it? And if someone came to one of the tabi'een and he said, do you see the fact that we make mistakes and ask for repentance or ask for forgiveness? Then come back to the same mistake and ask for forgiveness. Is it this not hypocrisy? Should we stop? And he said the shaitan would wish that he could be able to convince you to do this. No, it does not matter how many times you return to it, to that sin. Always come back to asking Allah for forgiveness. Because the Prophet ﷺ says, وَأَتْبِعِ السَّيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُوهَا Follow a bad deed with a good deed and it will erase it. So we go back to how is it that you see and you look at yourself? Repentance rescues you from the gloom of sin. Because when you sin, what happens is that you look at yourself 
and the light of hope starts to extinguish, you look at yourself and you say, I am a sinner. I am weak. I am defeated. Maybe there is no hope. The shaitan is stronger. You become polluted with sin. And your story then becomes a story of someone who commits this sin and cannot escape it. How do you escape that look into yourself? It's by remembering that when you repent, that repentance cancels that previous sin. It cancels it. And you return a new, a new person to Allah Azza wa Reset. As if when that repentance is actually sincere, as if you did not sin. Can you imagine, can you go back in time and uncommit something? No, you can't. But Allah Azza wa had given you the key that if you actually are sincere, It'd be as if you went back in time and erased that sin. It's not there. Even to the extent that if you're quick enough and sincere enough, it will not be even recorded. There's a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ that says that the angel on the right has authority over the angel on the left. So when you commit a bad deed, a sin. The angel on the right would say to the one on the left, hold off and don't write anything. Give him six hours to see. Six hours is a portion of time. Doesn't necessarily correspond to our hours that we have today, but a portion of time. Give him to see if he would repent before the lapse of six hours. If he does, don't write it. Right? It is Allah Azza wa Jal gives you a grace period. If you are, if you don't hesitate and you rush and you ask Allah for forgiveness, it could be as if you did not commit that thing. But of course you need to climb. You need to climb. Because whenever you do something good, a good deed, a good word, or staying away from the haram, it brings you higher, closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. You're ascending, right? You're ascending. When you sin, what happens? You fall, right? You fall. Just like Adam alayhi salam physically, right, fell from heaven to earth, we metaphorically, we fall. Few steps back, or many steps down. So now that you've repented, you need to climb up again. You need to push harder. And so there is a etiquette to tawbah. There's an etiquette to it. There is a push to it. So that you'd be included among those who أُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ You will be among those whom Allah Azza wa Jal will change their bad deeds into good deeds. Where you say to yourself, how could a bad deed become a good deed? It's because what you do because of it. That's one interpretation is because what you do because of it. If you, whenever you remember the time when you, let's say, did something haram, you remember it, you remember it, and because of it, you do something good. You say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Ya Allah, forgive me this and forgive me that. And you do something good as a consequence, that bad deed becomes a motivator for a lot of good deeds. And so that's how Allah replaces your good or the bad with something good. Is what you do as a consequence of sin. And I want to focus on the etiquette of tawbah, but I want us to see first of all what is the thing that is going to motivate us. To repent. First we said that if you do not repent, you will pay the price for it in the dunya before the akhirah. Right? If you wrong people, you will see the consequence in yourself. 
If you are unkind to your relatives, you will see the consequence of that in yourself. You will agonize. You will be hit by a calamity. If you do haram, it will reflect into your life, your provisions, your household, whatever. You will see a consequence. And do we need to go into the story of Ad and Thamud and the people of Nuh, those who were prosperous on earth? What did Allah do to them? Because they did not repent. Destroyed them. So if you don't repent, you will be punished here, before there. And also when you meet Allah Azza wa So that's one. Second of all, what is going to motivate you to repent is to have a guilty conscience. Even if what you're doing is wrong. Even if you don't think that you can leave it at this moment, but to have a guilty conscience that I'm, what I'm doing is wrong and I should stop somehow. This is not right. The greatest tragedy is for when the heart becomes so painted black that it doesn't see right as right and wrong as wrong anymore. Isn't that the greatest tragedy? You, there's always hope. As long as you believe that what I'm doing is wrong. Because there is hope for change. Right? But if you don't think it's wrong, and if you start and notice yourself, if you start justifying haram for yourself, then you should say, woe to me now. Because if, if you're doing something haram and you know it's haram, there's hope. Right? There's hope. But if when you start saying, yeah, but it's okay here. It's okay for me. Uh, there is difference of opinion. Whatever. You find justification for it. You're on a slippery so a slope. If you don't stop yourself, there is a time where you will say, no, this is actually good. And it is condemned and cursed in the Quran and Sunnah. You'll say it's actually good. And that is how you see some today, non-Muslims and also Muslims, they look at what is clearly objectionable and haram and they'll say, this is okay. They find no objection to it. How did they reach that? It's because it was a, um, a stairs towards sin. Steps that they took towards that realization. So you must have a guilty conscience that what I'm doing is wrong and I need to change. And for you to, stay, to have a guilty conscience, you need to have reminders. Who are those that are going to remind you that this is wrong? The Quran. Right? Dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. The righteous. So if you have bad friends who will always tell you it's okay to do this, you need to have people around you who will tell you you're crazy for doing this. The opposite. So you need to seek them. So if you have bad friends, and maybe at this particular moment you can't let go of those friends. I'm not going to ask you to let go of them. But find a balance. Can we not? Can we not find a balance? Bad friends, but can I not find also some better friends who will tell me that I could change? That there is hope for me, that there is another way, that I can earn money another way, that I can live halal another way, that to enjoy, for instance, the company of the opposite sex, it doesn't always need to be haram. There is a halal way, and it could be harder in the beginning, but ultimately it's more satisfying. Don't I need that? So bad friends, I need better friends. So where are those friends? Seek them, find them. And if you say, I'm not strong enough. I know it's wrong, but I'm not strong enough. What do I do? You say, okay, we'll tell you a very simple prescription. It doesn't require that you go anywhere. Can you not move your tongue? Can you say, Ya Allah, help me? Can you or not? Yeah. Can you not convince yourself to say, Astaghfirullah? At least, he said, well, am I, I'm, a, I'm a hypocrite. I'm doing this haram and I'm asking for istighfar. He said, you're asking Allah to forgive you. And if you ask Allah to forgive you, he will guide you to that. 
Why not say whenever you feel guilty of something, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Ya Allah, help me with this. Help me against this. Help me to, to move away from it. Why not say these things? So can you move your tongue with dua? Can you move your tongue with dhikr? He said, this is what we want from you. And from everybody. And nothing less than, again, to emphasize repentance, when Yunus alayhi salam was where? Inside what? Okay, inside the whale. What did he say? La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al So this, this joins both the glorification of Allah Azza wa Jal, the majesty of Allah, and admittance of your own mistakes and guilt. Ya Allah, I've done wrong. La ilaha illa anta subhanak. Implicit in that is forgive me. And you keep repeating it. And the Prophet ﷺ said that this, if you place it in a dua, it will be accepted. Your dua will be accepted. So if you want an accepted dua, say, La, la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al then ask Allah. So if we can move our tongue and ask Allah and engage in dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal, then maybe that will disturb our comfortable hearts, hearts that are comfortable with sin. Gotten so used to it that that's normal. So we want to agitate the heart. Start looking at wrong things as wrong things. So we need the remembrance of Allah and we need dua and we need Allah to ask Allah to accept our repentance and guide us to it. And if you can, stay closer to better friends and better company. Stay closer to the recitation of the Quran. Why not? And I don't care what you're doing. Why not whenever you're driving, play the Quran? I don't really care what you're doing. I don't care what type of sin you, you're doing. But play a recitation of the Quran that speaks to your heart. Because as long as you're doing this, and I don't look at that as hypocrisy, I look at, at that what? A person who's trying. And maybe an ayah will hit you one of those days and you'll say, I can't live like this anymore. Because as long as you're listening to the Quran, the heart will be disturbed. It will not be comfortable with sin. You'll feel uncomfortable, right? Like how can I like listen to the Quran and then go and do this? We sometimes we need to have like a distance, put a distance between us and the haram, between the halal and the haram or what Allah loves and the haram. That in itself is a good sign. If you do this, maybe the heart will be agitated. And if the heart is agitated, then the heart may ask itself, who am I? Am I a sinner? Am I someone who has been polluted with sin? Am I destined to die like this? Is there no hope for me? Can there be no repentance and change for me? And maybe you'll decide that it's time. And don't delay repentance. As we said, repentance is supposed to happen immediately. Don't delay it. As again, this is one of the plots of the shaitan. You're still young, he'll say. You're still healthy. Your whole life is ahead of you. You will repent when? Later. Don't you see all of those fathers and grandfathers? Now that they've retired, they go to the masjid and home, the hospital and home. When I become their age, I'll do exactly as they're doing. Becomes like a pattern of do whatever you want now, and then when you retire, repent. There are two problems with this, at least. What is the first problem? I'm sorry? You could die. No guarantee that you will live until you retire, or that Allah will extend your life a day or two or ten. So if you don't repent now, it actually may not happen. The second thing is that each sin that you commit with each passing day hardens the heart. And eventually in time, the heart may not be interested unless Allah saves it. The heart is not interested in repentance anymore. The heart loses iman altogether.
loses taqwa altogether. Salah, what is the salah? Zakah, I'm not giving my money away. Fasting, it's just too tiring. Even belief in Allah Azza wa Jal becomes shaky. Because the more that you sin, the less that you are attached to Allah Azza wa Jal and the shaitan plays with your mind and plays with your heart. So you can't say, I'll do it later, maybe later will never come. So you cannot delay it. You have to repent immediately. وَلَيْسَتِ التَّوْبَةُ لِلَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ السَّيِّئَاتِ حَتَّى إِذَا حَضَرَ أَحَدَهُمُ الْمَوْتُ قَالَ إِنِّي تُبْتُ الْآنِ Allah says in the Quran, and repentance is not for those who commit sins. Until the time that death confronts them, they say, I repent now. Because now is what? Now you're leaving. No. Allah will continue to accept your repentance as long as the soul is not started to pass through and exit the body. Pass through the throat to exit the body. But if it's starting to leave the body and you're beginning to see the angels of Allah Azza wa Jal arrive and you say, I want to repent, that's not time for it. When will that happen? You don't know. Why repent? Because all of us want Allah Azza wa Jal to love us. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ التَّوَّابِينَ Allah loves the, those who have tawbah. And let me take that opportunity to move to the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Why would he do tawbah every day despite him being the most righteous human on earth? And why is it that we need to do tawbah even if you're a person who comes to the masjid and recites the Quran and this and this and that? First of them, first of the reasons is no matter how righteous you are, do you commit sins or not? Yeah. Did you commit sins in the past or not? Yes. Did you know for sure that Allah forgave them? No. So the more righteous you are, the more sensitive you are even to the smaller sins. Right? If you're really, really sick, adding another sickness to you may not feel like anything. But if you're healthy, the slightest ailment is felt. Follow? So if you're really healthy, and if you're really righteous, you'll feel the small sins. And those soul sins in your eye will be big. And when you revisit what you've done in the past, it will be like a mountain sitting on your shoulder. And the Prophet wasallam he says that the mu'min sees his sins like a mountain on his shoulder. Like when you remember, you don't dismiss them. You remember the bad things that you've done. And you wonder, did Allah forgive them or not? And so that adds to your regret and sadness and determination never to go back to them and to do something good to overcome the bad that I was done. So that's you say, Astaghfirullah, 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 Ya Allah, forgive me, accept my repentance, accept my repentance. That sin becomes a motivator to increase forgiveness and increased repentance now and in the future. So that's one, because of the past. Second, because during the day, there are things that you could do, even recommended things, but you did not do. And things you should have avoided, disliked, not haram, disliked, but you did not avoid. And a distance that grew between you and Allah Azza wa Jal, that happens because you're busy working, you're busy cooking, you're busy cleaning, you're busy doing things that are worldly. And that does take your heart away from Allah Azza wa Jal and causes a little bit of ghafla, neglect, heedlessness. How do you come back to Allah Azza wa Jal? It's by istighfar and tawbah. What does tawbah mean? To come back to Allah. Tawbah means what? Again, to return. Meaning you're on a path, and that path is a wrong path, or is straying away from Allah, so you decide, come back. Come back. So every time you bring your heart back to Allah, that is what? Tawbah. And also, 
the Prophet ﷺ and those who are righteous ask Allah for forgiveness because of sins that are internal as well as external. When we say tawbah, a lot of times we think of tawbah from external sins. You know, like looking at haram. Of course, tawbah from that. Touching something that is haram. Of course, tawbah from that. But what about thoughts? What about thoughts and what about the actions of the heart? If you look at someone and you think the worst of him, even on the inside, your heart has strayed. If you know of a Muslim who had gone through some difficulty and you're happy because of it, that is something we need to repent from. That is a problem on the inside. If there is envy, you didn't say anything, but you're envious of someone's fortune or happy for their misfortune or you feel that you're better than them, that's arrogance. Or you have a, that disease of i'jabun bin nafs, you admire yourself, you think that you're better than other people. I speak better, I talk better, I walk better, I have more money, I'm more intelligent, all of that. I'm richer, so I'm better than you. You didn't say anything, but you believe that. It's in you, or it occurs to you. The heart had strayed, right? How do you bring the heart back? That's tawbah. You pull it back and you say, astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah from such a thought. Astaghfirullah from such a belief. Astaghfirullah from this and this and this and that. So the heart remains alive as long as it's repentant. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ modeled that. He said, I repent to Allah a hundred times every day. So there's a portion of repentance that is waiting from all of, for all of us every single day. When you do your dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal between Asr and Maghrib, uh, after Fajr till sunrise, before you go to bed, that is an opportunity to say your daily portion of Astaghfirullah a hundred times. Astaghfirullah, 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 Astaghfirullah. And again, it doesn't matter what kind of lifestyle you're living. It doesn't matter what type of sins you're committing at this moment or you've done in the past. Astaghfirullah, 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 astaghfirullah. And one of those times and days when you're saying this, what you're saying is going to coincide with the thought that you're having, which is that I should actually stop the bad things that I'm doing. And yet Allah forgive these bad things that I've done and I am doing. Astaghfirullah. And you will feel that your heart is starting to respond and is starting to move. And you feel that there is hope. And every single astaghfirullah, and every single day becomes a new beginning. And you're not that sinful person or defeated person or weak person anymore. Now, I'm gonna start new. Now, it's a new path. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he said, Inni ujaddidu islami kulla yawm. He says, I renew my Islam every single day. It doesn't mean that he doubts that he's a Muslim. But every single day, it's a rededication of La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. Today is a new day, I'll do better. Forget about yesterday. Because yesterday lingers sometimes. You, know, you remember yesterday, I had a fight with so and so. I said some bad things and this and that. That could control you. You say, no, today is a new day. Today I repent. Today I'm new. Today, astaghfirullah, let me try to do the best that I can. So every new day is really, in fact, a new day where you can escape the limitations of yesterday and ask Allah for forgiveness and for power. Now, when you repent... That's the etiquette, and that's inshallah the last segment of my talk. When you want to repent, you must regret. For a repentance to be true repentance, you must regret what you have done. It's bad. And I feel terrible that I've done it. And it had taken me away from Allah. And had put a black spot into my life and into my heart. Regret. And then the intent not to go back to it. 
Even if later on, even if later on you were to go back to it, but at that moment when you repent, you say, I'm not going back to this. That's it. And if you decide not to go back to something, what do you need to do? You need to understand how not to. Plan not, plan to how not to. Not simply say, I'm not going back and then do exactly the same thing that led you to it. So if there is someone who leads you to a haram and you recognize him as an instigator of sin, what are you supposed to do? Still keep him as a friend? Keep as much distance as you can between you and him? Or a space? There is a specific spot. If I go to it, or that neighborhood, part of the city, if I go there, I'll commit that sin. Should you go there, that spot becomes haram for you. Even though for another person it may not. But if it leads you to haram, it becomes what? Haram for you. If you're alone, it's a lot of sins are committed when you're behind closed doors, right? No one sees you. If you're alone, and you commit sins because you're alone, what are you supposed to do then? Not be alone. Figure out a way where, when you know that you are going to be weak and vulnerable, you're not going to be alone. You call a friend, you go outside, you go to the masjid, somehow you exit that state that is conducive to sin. Be smart about it, right? Be smart about it. And ask Allah for guidance. Sometimes we're blind to see our own mistakes. But ask Allah, Ya Allah, enlighten me so that I see how I get trapped every time. Because the shaitan studies you very, very well. You know how countries have spies? They spend spy spies on each other and they study them. And they know points of weaknesses. And they trap somebody into becoming an informant. They study so the shaitan's whole job is what? To study who? You. That's his whole thing. Like he knows you. This person sleeps this time, wakes up at this time. He likes to sleep. He likes to eat. This is what the sins that allure him. These are the things that repel him. He knows you. So as he knows you, you have to also know yourself. Add to this, I'll call it the etiquette of repentance, that if you have taken somebody's right, you return it to them. And finally, Do something good right after the bad thing that you've done. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that if somebody, that's the meaning of the hadith, if somebody commits a sin, and he asks Allah for forgiveness, then he goes and he makes wudu and he prays two rak'ahs and he asks Allah for forgiveness, Allah will forgive that sin of his. So each sin that you want to repent from must be followed by what? Asking Allah for forgiveness and two rak'ahs. You make wudu and you pray two rak'ahs. You make wudu and you pray two rak'ahs. After each sin that you want to repent from and you keep repeating, with as many sins that you want to be forgiven. And also add to that, sadaqah. Add to it sadaqah. So one of the sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya, no, ya Rasulullah, and part of my repentance is to give sadaqah because Allah accepted my repentance from me. So sadaqah as well. So he said, okay, I've done some, this thing that is bad. What will erase it? Because you want it to be erased. What will take it away? Another good thing that follows. If you have money, here is $5, $10 for the sake of Allah because I've done something bad. Right? And suppose that you don't have any, any money. Then at least we'll do what? Dua. And then find someone who needs help and help them. They say, say Ya Allah, Ya Allah, I don't have money to give but I want to help someone. Send me someone who needs help so I can help them. And subhanAllah, make that dua and see how Allah will send you someone. Just trust Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Trust Him that He does want you to repent. And Allah Azza wa Jalla, the Prophet Sallallahu he said that Allah Azza wa Jalla is so happy with your repentance 
that he is so happy with it that it is beyond any feeling of happiness that you have. You remember the hadith where he said that that man who lost his camel and his ride and his uh, food and drink in the desert and he thought he's going to die? Then he slept, woke up, and he found that his camel was right beside him and his food was right on the camel, meaning his life came back to him. And he was so happy. He said, Allah is happier than that man when you repent. It's amazing, Yani. We are to other people nothing. Right? To other people other than maybe your parents. Right? They love you and they, they, you, they think the world of you. But people in the street, are you anything to them? Not really. So if you repent or you don't repent, if you succeed or you don't succeed, they don't really care that much. Yet Allah Azza wa Jal, when you repent, you make Him so happy, it's a happiness that you have not even seen and you have not experienced. Then that makes you think, I am something. Right? If Allah Azza wa can be so happy for my repentance, I am something. And if you are something, why do you waste yourself by listening to the shaitan or doing the haram? Don't you know what is waiting for you with Allah Azza wa A heaven that you'll be so blessed in it. There'll be nothing that you want beyond it. You want to lose all of this because of trivial things in this life? You are something. And you are strong with the help of Allah Azza wa so give yourself a chance. And as we said, if we are weak, Allah is strong. So just ask Allah. Just keep mentioning Allah's name and asking Allah for forgiveness. The last thing, inshallah, that I want to say is that there was a brother, just before I started the, the uh, halaqa, he wanted us to make dua for his children. And I understand that a lot of our children are suffering, whether it is because of this problem or that problem. So he did ask us specifically to make dua for both of his children. So we ask Allah Rabbil Alameen for him and anybody else who has children who are suffering or going through hardship. Ya Rabbil Alameen, remove the hardship away from our children. Ya Allah, bring relief to them. Ya Allah, bring shifa to them. Ya Allah, bring shifa, complete shifa to them if they are in the hospitals and they are sick. And bring complete relief and guidance to them if they have, if they have strayed away from your path, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, whatever difficulty and hardship, we find ourselves in, our families, our children, we ask you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to take it away from us immediately, Ya Arham al -Rahimeen. We ask you to guide us, guide our spouses, guide our children to the straight path, to what you love and away from what you hate. We ask you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to make us of those who repent to you often, who remember you often, who make dua to ask you to strengthen them so that they have power over the sins and over their addictions. We ask you, Ya Rabbil Alameen, to make heaven our abode, our home, and make us of those who are rushing towards it, and make us of those who are forbidden entry into hellfire, and make us of those, Ya Rabbil Alameen, who remember you often. Enliven our hearts with your love. In how? Enliven our hearts with your remembrance. Enliven our hearts with the love of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bring us closer to you, ya Rabbil Alameen, and away from the shaitan, and make us aware of the plots of the shaitan so he does not tempt us. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.